Well, we tried that. It was, it, it's a little different, but we tried it. Amen. Well. <laughs> Make you want to get out and grab a partner. Hello, kind partner. Of did. You know, in the Old Testament, they did, they did that kind of stuff. Now, I know we've got Americanized and spiritualized and worry eyes and everything else, but in the Old Testament, man, they just got together and they had a big party in Jesus' name. Amen. I know, I know your religion has taught you that you can't do that. You got to sit there like a knot on a log, and that's a form of, uh, I guess, that's being reverent, you know. i, I give you an example. Now, I know you're thinking, say, that is, is totally gross, okay? But I'm a prime example. For years, if you burped around, you know, my daddy, he'd backhand you. You just didn't do that, you know what I'm saying? So after you eat at my house, you just sit there and swole up because you, you know, you know what I'm saying? Oh, your stomach start hurting. Well, after about the age of 40, I realized it's good to let that go, you know, and everything's good. You know what's sad is? A lot of us religiously were sitting there blowing up. Oh, my goodness. Religiously. That's actually good. What do you think? I was going to say something that was actually bad. <laughs> But, you know, we do religiously, honestly, we come to church and we don't know how to act. Well, you just have a good time. And if you get to acting bad, I will secretly say, hey, man, that was a little crazy. But the, pro hey, the problem is you got a good example. David, the Bible says David got so happy that he danced all his clothes off except his undergarment there a little bit. And I know it was pretty bad because his wife looked out the window and said, I seen you dancing before those girls. Or them maidens. And David said, man, I'll show you even more, all right? And I'll go even a little bit more crazy. So you know what? The good news is it's okay to bless the Lord and worship the Lord. Amen. I really believe this. I believe that worship, I believe that worship is something that helps us deal with our emotions. Because worship is a time of being emotional. You're coming to God. You know what I'm saying? You can't hardly worship without really thinking about God. And so you're here and you're having to deal with your fears. You're having to deal with your shortcomings. You're having to deal with the argument you had with this person. And are you going to go on and worship? Are you going to repent? All those things are going on when worship is going on. So God teaches us in worship uh, to be emotional, to deal with our emotions. And I tell you what, you'd rather deal with somebody or be married to somebody that's a worshiper than somebody that is not a worshiper because you know that they're dealing with the issues that's going on in life. Amen. Father, we love you. We're just thankful to be, be here in the house of God. I thank you for uh, being able to dwell with my brothers and sisters here in Christ. God, I just thank you that uh, this place is a safe place to experience you. Father, we're going to teach the word, and we hope the word goes deep into our heart and mind. But God, there's, this is not a place for us to condemn and put people down. Lord, we want to be challenged. We want to be challenged in worship. We want to be challenged in praise and worship. But most of all, when we leave this place, we want to know and say that it was good to be in the house of the Lord God. We love you. We bless you and honor you here in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
much you deserve Though I'm weak
say, Lord, I love you. have a grateful heart for who you are. I'm so thankful for who you are, God. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. Come on and just tell the Lord I love you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. You're good, Lord. You're merciful, Lord. Lord, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He's worthy. I promise he's worthy. Oh, Jesus, we love you. Uh, right quickly, uh, November the 1st would be the date. Friday night they're doing the uh, have football, which is Halloween night or whatever. And so we're going to do our hay rides and stuff uh, on that. So it'll be a Saturday, correct, Ben? Yeah. On Saturday. And what we don't necessarily do the Halloween thing, but we do hay rides. Uh, and we do our chili cook-off. Now, I have to admit, I don't know if I'm going to go for, for the Plummer family. We don't know if we're going to go through the third year of winning it or what. Uh, I promise you, nobody knows it's us, but we always seem to dominate. You know, I'm saying our food, Haley won it last time. I won it the year before. So y'all need to bring y'all's best chili out to come take us on here. Uh, rigged, well, I'm sorry. You when, it's, when you're good, you're good at that type of stuff. So, uh, uh So that would be uh, November the 1st. We need all the trailers uh, and really help getting firewood. I know some different people's talked to me about getting firewood, uh, firewood trailers. Last year, how many trailers we have? 
yeah, I think 10 trailers loaded with kids. So every year they kind of hate to see us come uh, to the lake. Every year we go to the lake and haze everywhere, but we try to pick it up, clean it up. So, uh, and that is uh, November the 1st. We'll be having a big hay ride and a chili cook off here. And, uh, uh, and I believe that you'll be blessed. And we need a little bit of help getting trailers and that type of stuff. If you want to, you can talk to Ben after service over the next couple of weeks about that. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Now, I did buy me some glasses uh, the other day, and I got them in, but I tried to do the wedding last night in them, and with the glares and stuff, I had to take them off. So we're going to have to figure out something different unless I got sunglasses with sunshades in it. I couldn't handle it. So uh, I'll just have to make my font bigger on my pieces of paper. Amen? Uh, so Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 18. We have been uh, over the past couple of weeks, and what I've been kind of excited about, I've had a lot of young people been coming to me, talking to me about the armor of God, talking to me about some of the stuff that they've been learning about us teaching on the armor of God, and that's thrilling to me. I like it when everybody learns, but it is big time thrilling to me when I see young people that are getting into it and they're learning the principles uh, about stuff. So uh, we are blessed about that. We're gonna, uh, we're not gonna be concluding on this because uh, we're gonna learn some stuff about prayer. When I, when I first thought about how I'm going to address this passage here, I was like, am I going to just hit this in one service or am I going to hit this in a couple of services? And to be honest with you, that same young person that was thrilled about the armor of God said, man, I want to hear all the different types of prayers. I want to know about prayer. And again, so I said, you know what, God? If people are hungry, I want to teach on it and talk about it, amen? So that's a little bit what we're going to do. We're going to be talking about the different types of prayer, and we're going to see in the passage of Scripture what he says about a few things here, and you're going to be blessed. I pray that you open your Bibles up. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can pull it up on New version. Go to a live event. All the notes will be on there until Wednesday. If not, we've got a few pamphlets you can hand out. But the best thing for you to do is follow it in your Bible. Uh, you may not always have your phone. You might run over with a tractor. You know, or that kind of stuff. So it's good to have this kind of stuff right here with you. Amen. Uh, so we thank God for modern stuff. But like I said, if it gets run over, you in trouble. Maybe, <laughs> hey, maybe you've hit enough word in your heart that you can make it, huh? You got it? That's what we want to do. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. By the way, if you're a first-time visitor, I'm sorry. If you're a first-time visitor here, would you kind of raise your hand like that and let us see you here? One here. Good having you here. Great having you. Right after service in the front foyer, we have a, uh, uh, a little gift for you. In there, we have some paperwork, kind of what we believe and what we're about. We'd love for you to go in there and get that. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Remember, he just got finished with the, talking about the armor of God, and then he talks about this passage right here, chapter 8, verse 18. It says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. It is so valuable to us if we can learn it correctly. It is strength to us when we can learn about it and it can strengthen us in our inner man. Father, as we enter into this text today, Lord, we realize that the text by itself is anointed. So God, I thank you that in Jesus' name as we enter into the text, I pray that you would challenge our hearts and lives. We love you, we bless you, and we honor you in Christ's name we pray, amen. I don't know how much of the notes he's got down, but uh, uh, we're gonna look at it. The, the verse 18 starts out by saying, praying always with all kinds of prayer. And we wanna first look at the word praying always. And we wanna, because how many of y'all would find it seem to be kind of hard to pray always? I mean, you got math class. I mean, you gotta work. And so it's hard to pray 
always. So what is what is what did the Holy Spirit mean when he caused the people to write this word down here uh, or write this particular word? Because let me tell you something. In the original context, when when the Holy Spirit spoke to men and they wrote particular words there, they understood what the meaning was. We have how many know there's there's six different words for prayer? Did you know that? There's six different words for prayer, and all the words we see is just prayer in the English. When you break it down in the original context, you'll see a different word and a different meaning there, and that is what we want to do. We want to start out with the most used word. This particular word is used 127 times in the New Testament. It is the most common word for prayer, and I won't even try to pronounce them, but it is a compound word with three different meanings there, and I want to break those three different meanings down as we move. The first part of the word again is en which means at when he's talking about praying always the first part of the word is at the next part of the word is the Greek word panti or panti means each and every it is a word that embraces everything including the smallest in the small in the most minute detail detail look at me so what he's saying he said I want you to pray at each and every time you get a chance it don't matter how small the request is or the need is, God wants you to be able to pray at all times. My wife is one of those type of people that a person can sometimes call me and ask me to be praying for them. I said, okay, babe, I'll be praying for you. Okay, buddy, I'll be praying for you. And Brandon be the first one that says, why didn't you pray for him right then? You know, and that is truth there. And mainly when I begin to break this passage down here, when he's talking about praying always, he's saying pray each and every time you get an opportunity. Now let's keep on going. The next part of the word is Cairo or Cairo means times or seasons. Now look what you put all that together. Look at it. Each and every occasion, each and every opportunity, or at each and every possible moment in life, we want to be praying. And you do it more than you think you do. You know, right before you get ready to take that test, you're taking that moment and that season to pray that God gives you the strength. You step up on the baseball mound or softball mound, you get ready to bat and you got runners on base. What are you doing? You're praying at that season or at that moment, God, help me to get on base here. When you're up there up to bat, I'm saying, oh God, help them get a hit here where we can win the ball game. Each and every season there is, he's saying you should always pray. Pray in every season, every time you get an opportunity. When you're driving down the road and you're thinking about things you need to pray, you really are already praying. We have a tendency to think about the things we need to pray and then we go get formal and try to pray the things we've already been thinking about praying. That is learning to pray at every season. If you're driving down the road and you're thinking about a particular person or a particular situation, God is saying that's the greatest opportunity you have right there to begin to think about it and pray about it and communicate with God. Alrighty, so God wants us to learn and we're gonna lay a little more down here in a second and get serious into this, okay? But God wants you, when you pray, pray always. Pray at every moment and every occasion you got, pray. And the reason why this seems a little difficult is because, well, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. Y'all just hang right there, okay? Let's go. The next part, he said, praying always with all prayer, right? If you don't mind, pull that passage back here. It, go back to verse 18 if you don't mind for me there. Can you do that for me? Praying always with all prayer. Again, praying always means at each and every moment with all prayer. That means every kind of prayer. Now, y'all hang with me. I'm trying, I want to try to show you something because we're fixing to get into something here in a second. So I preach at every moment and I pray with all kinds of prayer. The question is, we all of most of us don't understand all the different types of prayer, so we struggle with how to pray. The scripture says, praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Now, y'all hang with me. We're going to try to say, lay it down. So, number one, how often should we pray? 
Every time you get an opportunity, pray. Got it? When the enemy's coming in and trying to put you down, you should pray. When you sense danger in the life of your children, you should pray. When you sense a need around us, we should pray and not be fearful to be praying. Well, how should we pray? We should pray every kind of prayer he's saying here. You got that? Every kind of prayer. And over the couple, next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about some of the different ways of praying, but we're gonna spend, spend most of our time on the first type of prayer. Y'all hanging with me? Now look at this. Hebrews chapter 10, 9 through 20 says this right here. Having therefore, brother, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. How are we gonna enter into God's presence to pray? Boldly. Boldly. And we're going to do it by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not going to pray based upon your goodness, but you're going to pray based upon God's goodness. So if you got somebody to come to you and they have a, a prayer and maybe they're sick in their body and they want you to pray for them, the first thing that go to your brain usually is say, my Lord, I hadn't prayed good enough this week. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I didn't read my Bible this week. But that ain't how we enter into the holy place in it. We enter into the holy presence of God by the blood of the Lamb and we're able to pray for an individual or pray for somebody not based upon how good I've been but by the blood of Jesus Christ and we're able to take that occasion or that season to enter right in and pray with and deal with it. Boldly go right in there because it's in Jesus Christ that he's able and wants to do what he wants to do in your life. It says, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. There are six different prayers, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna read all of them out for you right quick, and then we're gonna get into some serious stuff here for a second, okay? There's the prayer of consecration, which we will deal with today. There's the prayer of petition. Prayer petition would be kind of like you have in the churches. We have all these different things we need to pray for, and we lift all these different petitions up to you. We got the prayer of urgent need. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. The prayer of thanksgiving. We'll talk about that in, in, in time to come. The prayer of supplication. We'll talk about that. And then we'll close out with the prayer of intercession, uh, praying in the Spirit, and we will talk and discuss those type of things. Amen? Uh, but the most common prayer that we're going to talk about today will be the prayer of consecration. Now, the prayer of consecration, uh, consecration again, comes from a compound Greek word, and let's look at it. The first word of it, first part of it is where we get the word pros or pros, okay, uh, which means close, intimate, or face-to-face. -face. It's the same word you get. We have peace with God, the word with there is the Greek word pros, which means face to face with God, and uh, we can come and come communion and face to face with God. Well, that's what the most common word in the New Testament is used for prayer. Prayer is when we learn to come face to face or get close to God and be intimate with God. Now, being intimate with God is a strange thing for a lot of people. And the reason why being intimate God with God is a strange thing is because a lot of us don't even know how to be intimate with anything or anybody, much less God. And later on in the scripture, later on in my message, we're going to talk a little bit about learning to be intimate with God. And the next part of that word is the word is a wish or desire or a vow. Come face to face with God with your wishes. Come face to face with God with your desires. Brother D does, I'm, I ain't trying to seem super spiritual here, but you're never going to find me hardly doing this or doing this. I know they write country songs about it, and I know it sounds real good, but most of the time Brother D is going to be driving down the road, and I know this issue is going to come up, and that's when I'm going to come face to face with God because he's with me. Intimate with God. He's not up there in heaven. He's not somewhere else looking for him. He is right here with me. So in my heart's mind, I can go face to face before my father and say, God, I don't know what this situation is. I, I don't know what it is. But, Lord, I thank you that through the blood of Jesus Christ that you're going to begin to answer these prayers, Lord God. And I thank you that I have the right to talk to you because of what Jesus Christ done. 
I don't have to come down with my head in shame. If I was coming in my own merit, then I would be in trouble. But since I'm coming into the merit of what Jesus Christ has done, I can come boldly into his presence. It's almost bragging, Jesus, the reason why I know you want to do this because you died for it. You see, I'm saying, God, I, I thank you that you want to do this more than I want it to be done. You, you see what I'm saying? It's coming face to face. Whatever your need is at the time, whatever it is you may have, it's coming face to face with God and learning to communicate with him and learn to allow him to talk with you and deal with it. Most of us struggle with that because we don't know how to be intimate. We got fears. We got things that cause us to have be fearful of God through incorrect teaching. But know this, God wants you to learn to come and be face to face with him and be intimate and with, communicate with him, bring your heart's desires to him and he will either give you those desires or help you understand that your desires may be incorrect. In a loving heavenly father's way, one, this tells us that prayer should bring us face to face with God. It is a picture of an intimate relationship, not a formula to follow. You got that? It's the most common. So in other words, we can't come to church and show everybody how religious we are. Father, we love you and we thank you that you're gonna come and be here. This is you and him. This is when nobody's around. It's you talking to him, redneck. You know what I'm saying? It ain't all the King James way. It's you talking to him the way you talk. And him probably talking back to you the way, the way you talk. You, you say I'm getting that? Got that kind of bird. So it's me learning to deal with him. When I'm coming through struggles, when I'm coming through issues, when I don't know how I pray, I can come face to face with God and begin to communicate him with my desires and the wants that I have need. How many of you we have a lot of that in life? See, the re this is why many of you do not, many of us do not enjoy praying. Number one, you're smart enough to know that it's not a formula. Oh, redneck country boy folks that hadn't had much religion do not like formulas. Young people do not like formulas. So when y'all call a prayer meeting, they're like, I don't understand all that. But the next problem why they're apprehensive in praying because they don't know how to be intimate with God. Now I've been saved a long time but it's probably only in the past five or six years have I learned really to get intimate with God and really communicate and talk with Him. For years it was with my heart but it's really more of a formula. Learning to just get real with God. Y'all hang on with me. We're going somewhere. Number two, it's also a picture of someone that desires something so desperate that they are willing to surrender everything for the answered prayer. 1 Samuel 1, 10 through 11 says it like this. Now, I realize this is an Old Testament, but it's an example of it. And she was bitter in soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed a look on the affliction of thine handmaiden and remember me and not forget thine handmaiden, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. Now, I skipped a couple of verses. We, we, we ended there, I think it's verse 11, and we're going to pick up with verse 19. And the reason we're going to do that, remember the story where Samuel. Excuse me, remember the, the, the story where, who, who was it, Samuel? Sam, no, when Samson. Who is the king that's watching them? No, the high priest here. Who? Yeah, Eli, that's it. Eli was watching her pray, and she's crying out to God to the point she looks like she's drunk. You hear me? She's crying out to God. We're talking about intimate here. You ever seen a drunk? Drunks are kind of for real, ain't they? Yeah, come on, have you, ever, have you ever seen a drunk? I have, I was one of those drunks. I'd get drunk at night and call Brandy. How you doing, baby? We broke up in high school. I love you. You love me? Boy, you drunk, bye. 
So look at me. She was like this, and then we get in verse 19. And they, arose, they, they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elk, I guess that's how you, Elk, 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 I guess, knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was to come about after Hannah had conceived that she bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked of the Lord. He gives him, look at me. It's prayer at this stage right here. It is an open face desire, and you're willing to consecrate yourself to say, Lord, I want this so bad. I'm willing to, how many of y'all done that before? Can I give you the good news is we don't have to consecrate ourselves no more. Jesus has already consecrated the veil for us. You, you get that? I ain't got to beg him. You know, Lord, if you get me out of this situation, I'll never do this again. Y'all got me? How many of y'all promised you, if you get me out of this, I'll never do this again? The good news, I don't got to promise him anything because he already knows the intent of our heart. We go, Dirk, y'all hang on. We're fixing to get something, all right? Y'all hang with me. All right, I'm going to jump that passage in Luke. Let's go to number three there. It also describes a person making a personal decision or consecration. We give our life for his life. Let's keep on going down to number four. It describes a person thanking God in advance for answered prayer. I want to read that passage of scripture. John chapter 11, 41 through 44. Y'all hang with me. Then they took away the stone from the place where uh, the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me, has heard me. And I knew that Thou hears me always, but because of the people which I, which stand by, I said it. They that that they and they I, I may have to get the glasses, and they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with the grave clothes. And his face was bound about with napkin. And Jesus said unto him, loose him and let him go. Look what Jesus said. I thank you that you hear me when I pray. Now, this is just some stuff that I want to lay out here. Put it together and then I want to talk about intimacy for a second. Putting all that come face to face with God. Surrender your life in exchange for his, making a consecration of an ongoing part of your life and giving him thanks and invest what well, in advance what's going on. Now let's get serious. You ready? If you'll hear what we're fixing to talk about here, your marriage relationship will be better. Your worship relationship will be better. Your relationship with other people will be better. And your prayer life will be a whole lot better. What causes us not to be intimate with God? To bring him our desires. What causes us not to get real with our relationship with the Lord? What causes us to have this formulas that we go through? The word intimate, y'all look at me. The word intimate means when two parties can share hidden thoughts and feelings you hear me when two parties can can share hidden thoughts and feelings to become vulnerable you ever been vulnerable with somebody to the point they know your absolute weaknesses and your strengths When I began to look at I heard a preacher want to talk about intimacy one, intimacy one time, and he, he used this particular phrase, and I said, I don't know. That's just somebody manipulating the text. But I went and looked for the word, the root word intimacy to see what it is, and it literally does mean into me see. The root word for intimacy is when somebody or God can look into you and see what's going on. Could you imagine your communication style changing with God when he can see everything that's going on in your heart and life? 
you won't use these these just crazy words. When you know he sees everything, you won't say, God, I, I thank you that uh, I'm sorry for this sin and I'm sorry for this sin and God, I wish, you know, I, I know I shouldn't have done that sin and everything and you spend 10 hours just to ask him, Lord, I need you to help me here. When you look, when you realize that in prayer that God can look into you and see what's going on, how will you handle yourself? See, prayer is when you and God can communicate with each other and he knows what's going on in your heart and mind and you know he's a God that loves you in spite of those things. Y'all got that? And that same intimacy can take place with your mate. But what causes us not to be intimate with our mates? What causes us not to be real with our husbands and wives? What causes us not to be real with religion and not causes us to be real with each other? Why do we got to put on a show like we're something special at church and when we're out there we can act a different way? What's the problem? See, God's the one person you can trust, the one person you can confide in, and he's looked into you, and he sees your heart, he sees your issues, he sees your angers, he sees everything that's going on. He's the one person that you can come face to face to and confide in and talk to, and he's usually the very one or the last one we go talk to about situations. We run to our wives, we run to our husband, we run to the preacher. We ask him to pray for us instead of learning to come face to face with God. He knows the real issue because you can hide your issues from me. You can say, Brother Damon, pray for me and I may not even be praying for the real issue. But with you, God, you can do this. What's the problem then? What causes us not to be able to Allow God to into me, see, see into me. Listen to this statement. As children, we were incapable of seeing ourselves as separate from our relationships. You understand that? When we were children, we were able to, we were not able to separate who we was apart from the relationships that we had with people. What has that got to do with the price of tea in China? If you got a daddy that didn't act like he loved you or showed you any passion or any emotions, you're gonna assume that exact same relationship with other people. If you seen mom and daddy abuse each other and do that kind of thing, you're gonna associate this is what love is really about so you're not gonna allow anybody really to see into your life or be a part of your life because you created so many mechanisms to hide what's really going on within your life. As a result, the reality we grew up in is the only reality we know. The only thing about prayer we know is what we've seen. And sometimes the only prayer we know is thanking God for the food. Well, thank God you blessed the food, but there's more intimacy face-to-face times that God wants to spend with us, but because our brain and our perception has been so twisted, we have a hard time understanding what life's about. In that state, we learn to survive. We're talking about as a child. They say that our brain until we get to about 12 years old is in a continued state of what they call a meta state. That means it's a continued state of meditating. It's taking everything they see and done and it's filing it in its brain and it's attaching a significance to it. In other words, if you see somebody slap somebody and they supposedly loved each other, your brain takes it and files it and says, okay, the way you show love is by being aggressive. Now, come on, I can go a little bit deeper than that, huh? What about your daddy molested you or uh, your aunt molested you or your cousin molested you? So somehow you attach that love is about this and you attach it and file it in the back of your brain. 
Maybe you didn't even have a father or have a mother. You attach every bit of those things and you put it in and you create what they call defense mechanisms. You create ways to be able to handle yourself without pain being in your life. You learn to be a tough guy and ready to fight anybody. My dad's dad died at the age of seven in a log accident. But he heard that his daddy was a fighter. So guess what my dad did? Come up his whole life, all he'd do is fight. He was a small guy. He'd fight. Him and my mom would get in honky-tonks and they'd fight. Just fight, hit people with pull sticks, just go slap crazy. He attached who he was based upon something he learned at a young age and that is how he defined himself. Look at me, look at me. We create, listen to me, we create defense mechanisms in your life and you won't let nobody to pass that boundaries. And the sad thing about it is the one that can help us the most, which is God, we won't even allow him in that boundary. We would rather have formula prayers than to get real issues and deal with the real issues at heart. I don't know why I don't like this. I don't know why I don't like this type of situation, God, but I need some help doing it. I don't understand why I don't like. Let me give you a for instance. The brother D's getting real here. You can pin me if you want to. I really don't care. Being messed with by a young lady when I was seven, eight years old created something in my mind as a kid that I didn't really have the greatest stand for women. You hear what I'm saying? Because of that, I was kind of standoffish for a woman and that kind of stuff. I, because in my brain, I, had to, I created mechanism in my heart and mind that I didn't have the greatest respect for a grown person messing with a kid. I just didn't comprehend that. So in my brain, somehow I made it out that all women must be bad. Just like some of you made it out all men must be bad. So therefore, I'm very careful who I would allow in my life and into my world, being intimate with them. And it is sad to say, but after 27 years of marriage, probably the last five years of marriage, have me and my wife become really more intimate. And I'm not talking about sexual. I'm talking about being able to discuss and talk to each other in a way. And it took all them years, but it first started when I began to really realize that God loves me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He's not mad at me. He's not angry at me. He has seen into me and he's seen things he may not like, but he also so loves me enough to help me migrate through those issues without putting me down. And when I begin to realize that God loves me like that, it gives me the okay to love other people like that. If God can love an individual in all of their effects and all of their things, how much God give me the ability to love people the exact same way? So when God brings somebody up, I don't say, ooh, good. They had tattoos. Ooh. They got earrings in their ear. Ooh. They're poor. Ooh. Kids, keep away from them because they come from a bad people. I say, my kids and us, let's go right up in the midst of it because we're world changers and life people changers because of what Jesus Christ has done. You don't separate people. You get involved in their world and you talk to them and love them. That way those guards can be brought down and you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. You can let them know of a person that loves them so much they see the baggage and the junk and they're still willing to be intimate with you face to face to build a relationship with you and you can learn to talk to him throughout the day. When fears rise up, you can talk to God about them, and he moves them out of the way. Thank God that's the most common word for prayer, that God and me have that intimate relationship. And y'all have heard me talk about that. I did my grandmother's funeral. I hadn't seen this lady in years. When I did my grandmother's funeral, there she was. 
Did I have ought towards her? No. You know what I just come to the conclusion of? Our battle's not against flesh and blood. I later found out her daddy messed with her and her grandchildren. So why do I want to be angry with her? If there's anybody we need to get angry at, it's time for us to get angry with the enemy and say, you know what you know what it is? We're going to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to people instead of continually being angry. Learn to be intimate with God. And when I first seen her, like, oh, God, how am I going to handle this situation? You know what you do? You kill them with kindness and you love them and move on because you don't know what's going on in their heart and mind. Amen? See, this is where we mess up. When we create our, y'all hang with me already. When we create our defense mechanisms to be able to, to handle situations, okay, we, we assume things. Give you, give you, for instance, you're up there batting and you're doing something a little correct, incorrect, and somebody says, What you need to do is you need to do this. I know what I'm doing. You're automatically assuming they're criticizing you like your mama and your dad or grandpa criticizing you. So you can't even receive instruction from somebody because you have created a defense mechanism that will not humble yourself enough to let somebody teach you something. So you, what you do, you build a wall up. You're not into my world. I'm not vulnerable enough to let you know that I can't hit the ball good right now. Now, I'm using my world. What's your world? Or on the job site, somebody tries to teach you how to do something a little bit better. You say, I tell you what, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been, in, I've been in construction now for 20 years. I don't need somebody to come tell me how to do it. You, you, you see what I'm getting at? And learning instead of learning to step back and don't take it as a defense. Young people, if y'all learn this, you'll go a long ways in life. Don't be so much, don't assume that then when somebody says something to you, they're like your daddy who left you. Don't assume that when somebody says something to you that they will get in your world and dump on you and get out of there. Don't assume everything's bad. Learn to assume the good and stop always worrying about the negative on stuff. When we start assuming why people do stuff they do, we're in trouble. Check this out. When we start assuming what God will do to us when we're praying or what God will say to us when we're praying other than what the word of God says, we will stop being intimate with him and talking to him. See, the church has committed idolatry. Now, y'all get with me. The church has committed idolatry because we have created an image of God that is not consistent with the life of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Now, some of you are probably going to get mad at me and not come back. God is not at this particular moment in the judgment business. Do you get that? God is not sending Ebola. Why would God have to send it from Africa if God wanted it? He could just raise it up and poke Mississippi. There is coming a time when the wrath of God will be will poured out on sin. But let me tell you something. God ain't in the cursing business right now. Jesus said he redeemed us from the curse of the law. God is a good God and God wants to love you and bless you. And we've created a God that's up there mad and sent an Ebola. He sent every bit of judgment on his son, Jesus Christ, on the Christ of Calvary and said, it is finished. God drove those planes into the towers. You Don't talk about my God that way. Amen. You're making an image of God that's just not true and we're telling people, go to funerals and tell them what God needed was another flower in his bouquet and he took your baby. I just want to jump up on the platform and just go, oh! <laughs> God don't take people. But the reason why some of us won't pray and talk to God, my Lord, what if what I'm going through is his judgment? If the life storm I'm in right now, maybe if I believe that God strikes people dead because of sin, what if, you know, in my sin, I want to get intimate with God, but I can't because I'm afraid he might bring me down. 
You know a lot of you don't go to God and talk to God. First of all, you don't know what to say to him. Another thing, you think he's mad at you. And if he's mad at you, where can you hide from God? There's multitudes of people high as a kite right now. Drunks right now. Because they don't feel like they can go talk to God. Because they heard some type of preacher say, you got a curse on you for doing something you did when you was young. God don't like people like this. And so we're raised up thinking that God don't like certain people. And if he don't like certain people, he ain't going to bless them. He ain't going to talk to you. So he ain't going to want to talk with me. See, for Colossians 1, 14, 15 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of his sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Come on now. You, Jesus, and I say it all the time. Look what Jesus said. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee. In the church, churches have time, won't even allow you to be involved. You can pay your tithe, but you can't even be involved if you've been married and divorced before. Not this church. We'll let you be involved and pay your money. <laughs> I'm being serious. Haven't we done? We've taken people, you know, come on, man. You know how it is being a step, the, the, the stepchild in the family. You know, the, the, the stepchild in the family, everybody else in the family's love, but you're the stepchild and you feel bad because, you know, I ain't part of the family. I shouldn't want that gift either. So I just kind of say, no, I don't want nothing. You know, I, down deep you're wanting, but you say, no, no, I'll be all right. You know, somebody tries to do something nice for you, no, no, uh-uh. And we create mechanisms in our life the fear of getting hurt and when we do that we can't even be intimate with God and he is the one person can I tell you he is the one person I can't even go to her and be totally vulnerable but my father in heaven you're looking at a boy that does it and does it regularly I asked him, what in the world did I think that thought for, God? Lord, if there's something there that I don't know about, talk to me about it. That's what type of God we serve. See, a person will never be intimate with God or anyone else until they have a healthy concept of God. For fun, and I'm getting ready to close. For fun, I went to go study judgment. I typed in the word judgment in the New Testament because everybody likes using the word judgment nowadays. And it was judgment was used, I think, 73 times. And do you know that none of them was used in the context of judgment right now? The day of judgment was used and all these things, but never. Now, you may have judgment, you know, you pronounce judgment, but your judgment's not correct, he would say. And then he would say to them, don't judge anything before it's time. But when it comes to judgment, you didn't see anything in it correlated with God. I went through all 73 of them, I think, looking. Because I don't want to teach you something that's incorrect. There is a day of judgment. There is a time of wrath that's coming. But let me tell you something. God ain't cracking a whip on you to get you to straighten up. Baby, if you want to go do it, he will allow you to do it. And that judgment will come upon you, but it won't be from God's judgment. It will be the direct result of doing your thing. Just quick. How many of y'all been taught that God will get you? If you do something wrong. I'm going to get you one way or another. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, get you, get you, get you some way or another. I'm going to find you. Now, honestly, come on, think about it. Being intimate with God and you got that mentality. 
Can you imagine? Oh, Lord, I'm just old scum birthed in this earth. I know I'm just a sinner. I'm just really bad, but I beg you, please, please, please. <laughs> you ain't even looked at him yet. Can I want to look? He got fire in his eyes and sword in his hand. You know, so, hey, you know. See, many of us have formed a incorrect assumptions about God's character and in doing so we have created no hiding place in life storms I'll read it again many of us have formed incorrect assumption about God's character and in doing so we have created no hiding place in life storms I'm grateful for this preacher here in the secret place of the most high God I will abide under the shadow of the almighty I will say of the Lord that he is my rock, he is my refuge, a very present help in the time of trouble. Adam, Enoch, and Noah walked with God. Abraham was a friend of God. Moses knew God face to face. God wants us to take the opportunity to lower our defenses and come face to face with our desires and our goals. Every opportunity you get. Praying always with every kind of prayer. And if you can get this one right, then you can have the faith to believe the rest of them are easy. Learning, learning to just be real with God, guys. When you're real with God and you know he's good with you, it ain't hard being real with people. Is it? I don't know why I'm standing on this side mostly. I don't know if they got more sin or I not want to look at y'all. I don't. Maybe I'm over here preaching to Lacey. Look at me. We're closing that. Look at me. Lower your bounds, man. If you're a born again child of God, lower your guard. And just learn to communicate. At first it would just be you spilling your guts to him. You hear me? At first it would just be you saying, man, I don't understand all this, Lord. You're going to have to help me. But then there will come time when he realizes or you realize that you're good with this. He'll begin to answer you back through the word of God, through other preachers, other people. Learning to come face to face with God. Building a relationship with him that is so cool. That is what's kept me from going absolutely insane being a coach. Kept me sane from being a pastor. Intimacy. Intimacy. Father, we love you. And we just want to say thank you for giving us a weapon to be able to learn to pray. And God, you're, you know, God, every little detail you're interested in. You're interested in how we do on the job. You're interested in how we do in our marriage. You're interested in how we do on the ball field. You're interested in how we do in relationships with other people. You're just that type of God. We just, you just care. And it wasn't a light thing that you were able to build this relationship. You were able to do this because of what Jesus Christ done. And that's how come we always pray in the name of Jesus. Not our own strength, but in what you've done for us. God, I pray for the people here today. I thank you that they're going to begin to strip all the formulas off. They're going to begin to build that personal face-to-face -face relationship. 
They're not going to come with their head bowed. They're going to have their head lifted up, coming to the face of God and learn to build that relationship. He's in you. You don't got to go find him. He's right there with you. And he's willing and ready to communicate with you any time. We love you, God. Y'all look at me right quick. I would have you to come down and pray for you that maybe some incorrect relationships you had pray for you. But can I tell you something? It's really a mind game for you. You can choose to move on or you can choose to live under that, whichever one you want. Whatever is causing you not to be just vulnerable to your mate, vulnerable to your friends, you need to learn to cut that off. Are you living a lie? I'll say, will the real Brother Rayford step forward? Will the real Ken Fister, not the one that has the facades, will the real one step forward? Will the real Sheila, can I see the real Sheila? The real Larry Jr. The real Haley Bell. The real Arlene Brooks. The real Brandy Plummer. The real Sabrina, the real Ben. Will the real person just begin to be who they are? In all my faults and failures, I trust in Jesus Christ, and I trust he's going to work that out in my life. Is that the person you want to be? That's the person D wants to be. <laughs> Amen. And if I find some long-nosed, fair sixty person mouthing off to you after you become vulnerable around here, just bring them to me. God may not be mad at them, but I'll get them now. 